job, guys. Okay, so today we're going to do inductive Bible study, and you guys are going to get to participate. So you didn't know that you were going to come and help preach a sermon with Michael, <laughs> but he's going to employ you. So this is Pastor Michael, and he's excited to teach you. Yes, um, and then there are also clipboards and pens strategically placed around. So... So if you could get something to write with, a passage of scripture is coming around to you. It will take some time to get to you, but we will eventually get everybody a copy of the passage of scripture that we're going to be looking at today. There are some clipboards. If there are not enough clipboards, which there won't be, there won't be enough clipboards. There are uh, Bibles that are black hardcover Bibles, and hopefully this is not too sacrilegious. You can use the hard surface of the Bible. I mean, you're writing about the Bible on the Bible. I figure that's good enough, right? So, yeah. Don't write in the Bibles, though. Don't do that. Okay. So, today, I'm going to be demonstrating to you, and you're all going to be participating in a small group inductive Bible study. Notice, though, the size of the group is significantly bigger than what we might call small. Um, you can actually do inductive study personally by yourself, one-on-one, -on -one, just on your own, solo. You can do it in pairs, you can do it in small groups, and today I'm going to try to demonstrate that you can even do it in a really, really big group, but it's not really my ideal way to do it. All right, so first I want to lower your expectations. Okay, so... This is not the only way to study the Bible. This is not even, I'm going to claim, the best way to study the Bible, although I like it a lot. It's simply one of the many ways to read and study the Bible. It's not even what I'm going to teach you today, the only way to do inductive study, which is a style of Bible study that I'm going to try to teach you. There are many different opinions about what makes for a good inductive study. I'm going to give you mine today, and it might not be the best. That's okay. I promise you it's good, though. It's good. And I like it. So I'm going to share with you what I have found works really well, especially in small groups of people, you know, three to eight people. All right, so first, a word about why this is called inductive. Anyone need more pens? I got a whole more pack of 10 pens. Um, so it's inductive in the same way that empirical science is inductive. And don't worry if you don't understand those empirical, but here's what I mean. So suppose you wanted to know the flow of water in one of the local washes or rivers around, right? So you might come away with a certain impression about how much water and the way the water flows in the wash right now if you were to go look, okay? You would have a different impression if you were to measure the flow of the water, say, sometime in July when the monsoon season is going on. And so what you want to do in good empirical science is that you want to measure the water flow as many different times as you can over a long period of time at many different times of the year, maybe also in the morning and also in night. You want to have a wide variety of different data points, and you want to collect them all. So this is part of the inductive process. And then once you have a huge amount of data, all kinds of different little collection points about what the water flow is or whatever it is that you're measuring, then you can do a induction on this and you generalize what is generally, universally, or as close to universal as you can say, true about this river, this water flow in this particular wash. And that's generally what we're trying to do with inductive study. We're going to try to look very carefully at the text of Scripture. We're going to be very particular in looking at exactly what words are there, the order of them, right, the structure of them, and we're going to make lots of careful observations, like we're collecting data. And then, and only then, after that, we're going to come to some kind of general idea of what it all means. So that's 
pretty much the inductive method of Bible study. So what I would like you to do is flip the page over so on the blank side, and I would like you to roughly divide it into thirds. So at the top left hand, I want you to write the letter O, nice and dark. And then if you go about a third of the way down the piece of paper, write the letter I. And then one more third down, write the letter A. <laughs> My son is very excited about this. Okay, you should all be too. It's very exciting. Okay. All right. So we have O I A going down the page. O O stands for observation. So write observation with your O. Or you can pluralize it if you want observations. Okay. I stands for interpretation. You write it in. And then lastly, the A stands for application. And according to my inductive study method, these are the three categories of inductive study. And many inductive studies follow the same format. All right, so um, I should have my lovely assistant, Matt, come up and start getting set up as we, as we talk about this. Yeah, uh, you've got boards over here. Actually, I could use another lovely assistant. You don't have to be lovely. You can just be an assistant if you... I could use another board. Yeah, Rose, you want to come up? Yeah. We can wheel this one over here. Okay. Whoa, that wheel is janky. Okay. Oh. All right, cool. All right. So what are observations and what are we doing? Well, we just want to look extremely carefully at the text, like I'm saying. So whatever helps you to look extremely carefully at exactly what the words of the text are. So if you want to write next to observation, the guiding question of observation is, what does the text say? And we can do a lot of different things to try to categorize and put together exactly what the text says. One of my favorite things to look for are repeated words. As you look at the text, is there anything that gets repeated over and over? Is there a word that keeps coming up? Is there a word that's repeated? Is there a phrase that's repeated? What are the phrases you could get into the structure, the grammatical structure, so you could reach back into your memory of grammar school, right, and learn, remember all that stuff about diagramming sentences that you were taught? Some of you are like, oh, no, no, not that. Okay, this could be really helpful for figuring out exactly what's in front of you that the text says. You can diagram the sentences. You can figure out where the clauses are. You can identify the nouns, the verbs, the prepositions, the adverbs, the adjectives. Some people love to get like color-coded different things, like different colors of uh, pens or colored pencils. Girls especially I've seen get really, really into this, and I'm, I'm all about It's great. It's fantastic. You should do that. If you are excited about that, you should go into that and do that to the full ex extent that you can. Um, permitting time and patience and the patience of those around you. Um, as you're doing this, but it can be really helpful to color code things. Um, you can look for uh, logical connectives, words like therefore, or contrast words like but or although, premise indicator words, which is another kind of log logical connective. The word for is one of those, or in conclusion could be something that triggers what kind of the logic of the text is. Um, what are the things, Matt, that you like to look for? You want to grab the mic right behind? Yeah. Okay. 
so Michael and I have been doing inductive study in our pilgrim group for the last year yeah. on different different books of the Bible. Um, I Particularly with Paul, I really like verbs. I verbs. just try to find verbs, all the verbs in the passage, see which verbs are like the primary verbs and which ones are sort of strung off of the main the main sentence. Cool. That's good. That's a good tip. Identifying verbs is really, really good. That's a good way to go. Um, this passage that we're going to look at is not especially poetic, but there are parts of scripture like the Psalms that are, and there are other little interspersed pieces that are more poetic-like. So you can identify also going back to your English classes, right? Everything that you know about literature analysis, right? So what figurative language is being used? What's the symbolism? What's the imagery? Are there metaphors or similes that are being used, right? You can make all those kinds of identifications in the text as well. I don't know if we're really going to need this, but if you see things that seem metaphoric, figurative language, you can pull those out as well. All right, so what I would like to do is I would like to give you about five minutes to actually do this. I would like you to take any of the suggestions that I just made. Um, I don't actually want to tell you what the passage is. I just want you to look at it. This is also another tip, actually. This is a good excuse to talk about this. Huh? Uh, we'll tell them later. Okay, so um, I, I highly recommend printing it out on a piece of paper outside of your usual Bible and, um, and taking it out of the usual context that you read it and maybe even reading it in a different translation of the Bible than you normally read. So this is the NASB, which is a translation of the Bible that I don't usually read, but it gets me out of the mindset of thinking all the stuff that I usually think, the phrases that I'm usually uh, looking for when I read the NIV, which is what I typically read. So it's good to get it fresh and outside of your usual ideas so that you're looking at it as if it's for the first time. Okay, so I'm going to give you five minutes, and feel free to make any notes, underlines, circles, um, doodles, connections, arrows, exclamation points, whatever you want to do. I double-spaced it for you, so hopefully there's room. And make observations. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so we've had about five minutes by ourselves. Uh, how should we divide this up? Maybe we'll have Matt do most of the observations here until he runs out of room. Okay, things that you have observed, and I need uh, I need Philip and... Could you grab that second microphone right there? And I will have... I will have... Have Rose do the microphone? Okay. All right. So those of you who have done inductive Bible study before and are fairly confident in this, use your confidence to boldly say what you observed in the text so far. Give us an example of good observation. All right. Uh, first thing I noticed was the repetition of in him or with him. Good. So I counted in him five times, with him three times, and then through him at the end once. Other observations? You got a microphone right there. What'd you say? A lot of it's in past tense. Love is in past tense? A lot of it. A lot of it. Okay. A lot of it is in past tense. A lot of the verbs are in past tense. Good. Good observation. Here we go. I noticed a lot of the verbs in the first sentence, received, walk, rooted, built up, established, instructed, overflowing. Good. Yes. So I think the main verb there is walk, and all the other ones are kind of branch off of that. Yeah. Yes. All right. Christ or some version of that was referred to 14 times and you or us was referred to 13 times. Cool. Good, good. So Christ, you said how many? 14. 
or Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, right, 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 or him, okay, oh, including the pronouns as well. Got it, okay. Bob says it's 17, but, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then us, us or you, was 13 times, okay. Other observations? The author was overly using passive voice, and it was quite aggravating. Okay, yeah. Yeah, mark him down, huh? Active voice is preferred. Uh, yeah, okay. There was in accordance three times that I noticed. In an accordance. Okay, good. I'd say the other main, main verb, so the one was walk in him. And yes. then the other thing about walking him was see to it that no one takes you captive. That's a pretty long verb. At, but at verse, <laughs> at at verse, verse the very beginning of verse 8, yeah, the yeah, second paragraph. Yeah, and so that like everything else just hangs as a reason that we need to protect ourselves for that. Okay, so walk is the main verb of the whole first paragraph, and then the whole second paragraph is see to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. And see to it was an imperative. Like it's you, yes. you see to it. It wasn't yes. like... It will be seen too. It right, was, both of those are command yeah. words. Yes, they're in the imperative. Walk and see to it that no one takes you captive. Um, in at the end of um, verse twelve, okay, it um, is pointed out the active person, which is the working of God. Okay, yeah, which is part of. Well, let me save that for interpretation. But I think there's an important thing that we might note about the pass overuse of the passive voice with that observation as well. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this, but it starts, the first word is therefore. So yes. the obvious question is what came before. Okay, good. All right. Um, I am going to write that question down over here under interpretation. Um, actually, maybe over here. What came before? Cool. <laughs> What's the therefore, therefore? Yeah, that's, that's the little slogan. Put it on a bumper sticker. All right. It's interesting that it's not just rooted, but firmly rooted. Firmly rooted, and yes. And not just deception, but empty deception. Good. Good use of adverbs there. Yeah. And adjectives, yeah. Um, noticed also just a, a laundry list of what the threat is. Okay, good. Like uh, philosophy, empty deception, uh, human uh, human tradition. Good, good. Elementary principles, uncircumcision. Cool. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. All right, Mike's got one more. <laughs> Uh, there's a there's a list of several things about the nature of Christ or his actions. But yeah, good. The nature of Christ or his actions. Excellent. Karen's got one over here. So I'm wondering if anyone else noticed all the metaphors. It's just packed. Okay. Yeah. Packed. You want to? Yeah. Yeah. English teacher here. Good. Good. Yeah. Excellent. No Some one's of these are metaphors yet. we're really used to in Christianity, so they may not stick to us as metaphors, but they are. Yeah. Good. So firmly rooted. Yeah. Built up. Okay. Takes you captive. Right. That's a military reference, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, head. So we've got plants. Head and we've got over every ruler. Head and over every military. ruler. We've got and the then, body. And then there's a metaphor he explains out some, like circumcised with a circumcision performed without yep. hands. Good. And the removal of the body of the flesh. So that's an extended metaphor. Right. Buried with him. Buried. Is yeah. a metaphor. Right. Raised with him. Yeah. Certificate of debt. Right. And honestly disarmed the rulers. Cool. So there's a lot of power stuff going on in this passage. Especially at the end, yeah. Good. Um, I think I got them all. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there's a lot of metaphors. Right. There are. There are. I always tell my kids, if there's figurative language, you got to pay attention to that. Nice. Figurative, figurative language. language. Yes. Figurative language. So words that extend out an image or a metaphor. 
Yeah, Eric's got a hand up. No? No, you're just twiddling. Okay, I think we can put to close, I mean, for now, the observation, but you could see we could kind of do this all day, you know, until we got bored of it and we're like, all right, let's move on. But you can, you can do really serious study and make intensive observations until you just run out of patience or you run out of time. So today we're just going to run out of time. I like to make the transition to interpretation, and then you can flip your paper back over here. And the, the central question for interpretation is, what does the text mean? And I'm going to put a little hermeneutic here to borrow from Jim last week. The most important aspect of the meaning of the text that we want to hone in on is what would it have meant to the original audience and what did the author of this text intend to convey? So what was intended to be communicated and what was communicated to the people who originally would have heard or read this? And those are both a little bit more specific ways to ask the question, what does the text mean? So I like to transition from observation into interpretation by having people ask questions. What is it about this text that you would really like to know? And then I, I want to do an important qualifier here. I'm not promising we're going to actually answer that question right now. But if you have a question, it's great to have, we're going to have Rose do all the questions. Because we already have a great one up here, which is, what came before? Okay. So what questions do you have of the text as you think about what it might mean? Where are you foggy? Where would you like to know something? Jim's got one and Bob's got one. And we might need another mic runner in the meantime while Rose is up here. Yeah, yeah, okay. What does it mean out. to walk in him? What, what does it mean to walk idea? in him? Good. What does it mean to walk in him? Excellent question. Yeah, <laughs> really big. As big as you think that you can write, Rose. What does it mean to walk in in him. How do we see to it that we don't get taken captive through empty philosophy? How do we not get taken captive or see to it that we don't? I've got a mic. Okay, so cool. Ask a question. <laughs> Who's trying to take me captive? Oh. Who is trying to take me captive? That was actually what I wanted to know. What, oh, you stole what, Bob's. What is going on here? Why is somebody actually physically trying to uh, who, deceive them or something? Who is trying to deceive or take captive? Okay. So, Michael, I wanted to know, is, yes. it, is it actually happening or is this just like a cautionary... Great question. Is it actually happening or is it caution? Okay. Anticipatory caution. I, I can ask one more. I guess you could. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, who, I, I forget the exact word, but who are these or what are these powers that Jesus has made okay. a spectacle of? Yes. What are the powers? What or who are... The powers. Oh, uh, what or who are the powers in... The powers and authority. Ver, yeah, powers Ruler, and authorities. Ruler and authority. Rulers. Does it say rulers well, and authorities in 15? And then ruler and authority came up in 10. Yes, and so, back in 10, ruler and authority. Is yep. that a person mm -hmm. or is that a spiritual Great question. force is what I'm wondering. Yep, yep. Or rulers and authorities, both. ruler and authority, yeah. Verse 10 and verse 15. That was what I was wondering about. Yeah. Sorry, powers is a different translation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's plenty. We've got plenty of questions. All right, so here's what I like to do with interpretation, and here's where the 
analogy back to the science, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the observations that we've made in the text, the data that we've collected by carefully observing the words, the phrases, the sentence structure, and so on. We're trying to use all of this stuff to answer some of these questions. That is the business of interpretation. So, once again, not promising we're going to answer every single question that we generated right now, but if anyone would like to take a stab at one of the questions using some of the text, that's what the next phase of the inductive study is for. Yes, Danielle would like to answer a question using the text. For the first question, what does it mean to walk in him? Yeah. Using the observations, it is repeated in him and with him many times, which seems to me that intimacy with him and paying attention to him and constantly directing your gaze to and with him is how you walk with him. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Really nice example. You got a little golf clap over here from the other corner. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Other attempts at answering a question using the text. Yes. Yeah, just a second. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. I heard Karen talk a lot about military stuff as I was coming in. Yes, we have captive and we have, yeah. How does the walking fit in? Are we in a regiment? A good, another great interpretive I mean, question. Yeah. As a church, are sure. we a regiment? Well, uh, great question. What do you think? Oh, you're asking me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying to answer these questions as best we can, trying as hard as we can to use the text right in front of us. Well, I'm not a military person, <laughs> and I'm kind of an individualist, but sure. I'm thinking we function as a regiment. Okay. And I'm not sure what that means. Okay, cool. Hey, great. Other questions we think we could answer? So we've got a lot on the first one. What does it mean to walk in him? Okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something else. Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. If no one else will. <laughs> yeah, be bold. Um, so when it talks about, when we talk about who is taking us captive, I'm just noticing through the philosophy um, well, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at kind of the end of those sentences. So human tradition, who is trying to keep, keep, take you captive? Human tradition, elementary principles of the world, rather than Christ. So like, if Christ is how you walk with him, then it looks like human tradition, elementary principles of this world. Like, that can mean culture, that can mean just worldliness, like... That seems like that's what's trying to take us captive. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could look throughout, but just in that first sentence, cool. those are the things that Great. Yeah. look like. Good reasoning. Good thoughts. Other thoughts? Other questions that we might want to try to take a stab at? So we got, we've got some ideas about uh, what does it mean to walk? Who's trying to take us captive? We've got this other question, how do we not get taken captive? Yeah, do you want to go for Mike first? Yeah, let's go. And we can go back to Evelyn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what does it mean to walk with him? So it, I'm noticing it, we talked about the past tense. We are able to walk with him because he's completed a lot of, of uh, work in us by nice. removing sin. We've been buried with him, so there's a lot of this completed action that enables us to walk with him. He's taken out of the way the sin that, that keeps us captive. Excellent. Great. I, yes. So, <clears throat> first of all, Keith prefers that it be called a squadron because he's an Air Force. Oh, oh yeah. And okay. Not a regiment. There's, um, there's a whole bunch of military, which is always a squadron, right? Um, but the imperative is see to it that there is, like, so it's directed to the community as a whole and not 
just to this individual. So. Cool, excellent. This actually would be a good way, a good thing to tell you some extra information about this. So the writer of this is Paul, okay? And he's writing to the church at Colossae, the Colossians. We spent a lot of time talking about this kind of recently, so it's, it's good. You might not have recognized it, or maybe you did. Maybe you're like, wow, this looks really familiar. Like, we just talked a lot about it over the past two months. Okay, Patrizia had something back there. Oh, well, I mean, if Ryan wants to go too, I mean, whoever, yeah. So we were talking about the tenses. A lot yes. of it is in past tense, but right. there are some that are in present tense. And okay. so I want to go to Lee's question about, um, is this happening now? Or oh, is it precautionary? Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Um, it, because see to it is not past tense. Okay, right. And um, it's present uh, right. imperative. And the next verb also, that no one takes you captive, also right. present tense. True. Or maybe imminent future. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that's happening, or it will be happening right there if you don't see to it. Great. And then Ryan, I think, had. So um, I kind of wanted to address some of the questions of interpretation having to do with, like, you know, the original audience and just thinking about the historical context. Cool. And yeah. You know, it's always risky to do this because, like, I, I didn't live in ancient Rome. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> but you can tell us what I you didn't think live you in know. antiquity. It's but right. I, you know, I may have studied it, but you know, yeah. I didn't live there. Um, but the, uh, from what I understand, the the culture at that time was very authoritarian and top down, much more than we would understand today. And so, thinking about like, all right, who is trying to hold you captive? You know, and he mentions every ruler in authority. So, like you know, there's always someone who's going to be telling you what to do. And whether it's it's uh, the Roman government or pawns of the Roman government or the local councils or religious authorities of the day. And so everybody is, ha has a hand and in, an interest in telling you what to do and how you should live. And this is basically saying all of that is subject to Christ, which kind of created the environment for the persecutions that happened in the early church. So, yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, there might be one or two more, and then we should close up after the last two. I think Hannah will finish up with Hannah. Yeah. I think in answer to how do we see to it that we not get taken captive by empty deception and human philosophy, human tradition, we get a statement of what the true philosophy is. Nice. So living under, like remember that in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Remember that in him you have been made complete. Remember that he is the head. And just all the way down the page, yes. remember, remember, remember. If we remember what's true, then we won't be taken captive. Excellent. Good. Um, yeah, my thought was similar. I was I was starting to number down the page. So I was thinking, see to it is very active. And then I was writing down the things that we are. And yeah. I think we can make a list of who we are and then also who Christ is. Right. But I wrote one, like, so part of seeing to it. Because if you simplify verse 8 and make it a simpler sentence, like, see to it that you're not taken captive through those things that Danielle talked about, um, then... Uh, because, and I like how Sue said it, the true philosophy, it seems really important, verse 9, that says, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells. Mm -hmm. So, like, he's the fullness, and out of that fullness, you've been made complete, you've been circumcised, you've been buried, you've been raised, you've been made alive, you've been forgiven. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to close up interpretation. So, it's not that this is everything that could be said. I mean, we could go on and on and on. But once again, we limited by time and maybe patience. Okay, so we want to move to application. 
So application, this, the overall question for application is, what do we do? Yeah, you want to flip it around? That'd be great. Yeah. What, what do we do? How should we live? So if you want to ask it kind of riffing on the interpretation, so if this was, what does this mean to the original audience? Application is, what does this mean for us now, or for you individually? What should we be doing with our lives, given that this is said? Don't, don't worry about being too, like, yeah, duh. Like, sometimes it's really obvious in a text like this exactly what it is that you think we should do. Well, one of the things that 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 I just mentioned is like a lot of it we like you're calling on us to make sure the application doesn't come from what I thought ahead of time that'd be yes. deductive right. but rather what I saw that's inductive yes. and this or I, I'm sorry with the interpretation and yes. same with the application it shouldn't be you know we all just need to love Jesus better wouldn't that be good and uh, I think we all should also should give give generously let's take the offering yeah. um, but rather what is the what is the <laughs> passage <laughs> What is the passage pointing us yes. to? Yes. And so one thing that, that jumps out at me is Emily's observation about the, the red, I mean, squadron. And so, yeah, I, I need to enlist in the squadron and figure out who the squadron leader is and, and find out how to be a good member of the squadron. Nice. Thanks. Um, in the beginning with the observations... I, like Hannah, was really struck by all the verbs yes. in verses 6 and 7. And I think they're really profound um, just to walk in that identity and just to remember that you've received it, you've received Christ, you're rooted in him, you're being built up, you're established in him, and um, you were instructed this way, and you're overflowing with gratitude. Like, those are, that's, that's a lot of, like, directives to walk in you know what i mean um so i don't know i think that just remembering uh who you are and being established and rooted is really encouraging and um yeah that's what my takeaway from nice so i wrote down walk in the identity you've been given excellent other things you're like i i read this I heard people talk about it, and now I'm going to do, what am I going to do? I don't know if this was already said, because I stepped out for a second, but <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> I've, I've got, yeah. go for it, Matt. Um, this is sort of the negative of that, which okay. is there's this, uh, this idea that the threat is that we're being taken captive or being deceived. Hold it a little closer. Yeah. And maybe one application is just sort of to ponder how have I been taken captive? How okay. have I been deceived? Has this already happened in some ways? Are there ways that I can be liberated and return to that identity? Excellent. Really good. Michael, I, uh, Oh, hello. <laughs> hey, hey, yeah, yeah, that was uh, very deep. I, I love when reading scripture, like, and doing this process to, like, just find one little mantra and the see to it. See to to it. me, feels very much like, okay, I'm going to do some exercise now. I'm going to see to it. And so I, that's just a way of heading out of the door today. Like, I'm going to see to it that no one dot, dot, dot. Excellent. So. Great. See to it. It's very motivational, yeah. Uh, kind of similar vein. Uh, be in Jesus. Be in Jesus. I think you could also substitute the preposition with. Be with Jesus as well. I'm thinking. I'm thinking that... When I look at my life, if I'm not overflowing with gratitude or if that's not what our 
we're looking like as our squadron community thingy. <laughs> uh, it seems to me like I'm not walking in and standing in these profound things that are true from that I'm um, that I've received, that I'm firmly rooted, that I'm built up, established. Um, it seems like standing in those things that all that's been done causes the gratitude. Yeah. So I'm going to add one from uh, what Sue said earlier, which is remembering, I think, is really important. Yeah, we got two over here. Um, I'm seeing a warning in verse 8. Um, it begins with see to it, which is imperative for us. Right. But then see to it that there's no one that takes you captive through all kinds of things. So the understanding I'm, I'm getting from this is that there are people who want to take us captive by through philosophy, through empty deception. You know, it has a list mm -hmm. of the ways that they try to do that. So it's a warning for us to be aware of that, to be aware of their ways and their strategies so that we can be wise and watch out. Yes. Good. And then Ryan had one. I'm, uh, I'm just struck by the, uh, all of the contrasts that are yeah. in here uh, between you know philosophy and human tradition and all of those things being captivity versus you know experiencing Christ's leadership, His authority, which is freedom, and you know as as uh, Tessie was saying that there, there is a warning, you know, not to get drawn back into captivity when you have been set free. Uh, that you once were dead and now you are alive. Um, you know, the, the, the debt that you had to pay because of your wandering from God has been canceled. So remember that and walk in that. Good. Excellent. Um, we'll and finish up with... Yeah, okay, we got uh, Lee. Um, one of the questions I asked was, how does one receive Christ? Because it says... Ah, good. Therefore as you have received Christ, don't just stop sure. there, but right. um, so walk. And um, I think it was for me by grace through faith and then repenting every time, well, not every time, and repenting of my wrong thinking and embracing the gospel. And so walking might mean the same thing. Good, good. Uh, well, I said by grace through faith with repentance after realizing the truth. He also said embracing the gospel, and I liked that phrase. Okay, we got one or two, and then we got to close up because we're running out of time. These are, not because we're running out of good things to say, just we're running out of time, yeah. Well, I was instructed struck, I guess this is a weird set of words, uh, <laughs> as you were instructed, I, I'm sure just as in this community, a lot of people have had much more instruction than I have, and there's others that I've had more instruction. So everybody's working from their own knowledge base, I guess, and Christ knows that. I'm not even sure where this is going, but I guess we should try... <laughs> We need to get instruction Good. at whatever level we're capable of. Get instruction. Good. That, that's the application nice. that I want to take. <laughs> yes, get instruction. And if I could mix it just a little bit with uh, the scripture reading that we had, uh, read and pay attention to the instruction that you've already been given. <laughs> yes. I, I think this uh, kind of goes, goes with a lot of what we've been saying. And a lot of these applications are not tomorrow, go take these actions. A lot of these uh, interpretation, or, I'm sorry, applications are uh, today and tomorrow and going forward. Remember 
that uh, one of the ones that struck me is that our uh, our debts that's been nailed to the cross and that that forgiveness we've received but uh, there's so many sometimes it's promises to believe and sometimes it's just kind of it's building our faith with this content and that that's a lot of what will turn around to change other things we do with our hands and mouths okay so my son says it's time it's over Thank you so much for my, all of my lovely assistants.